This morning we're, we're continuing our series in the book of John titled Last Words, Ultimus Palavidus. And what we've been doing in this series is we've been looking at Jesus' last words, really his last conversations with his disciples with his disciples leading up to his crucifixion and his resurrection. So imagine him and the disciples, Jesus and the disciples are in the cenaculo, they're in the upper room, and Jesus is basically going through a series of conversations with them. Um, and we've seen some of the conversations over the past few weeks. Jesus uh, first washed the feet of the disciples. We talked about that a few weeks ago and about how it was amazing that Jesus actually whitewashed the feet of Judas among others. We also saw that Jesus comforted his disciples. He said, in my house are many rooms. In heaven there are many rooms for you, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you in heaven, which actually means that he was going to the cross because it was the cross that prepared the way for them to go to heaven. Besides that, then Jesus last week, he talked about the idea of love and obedience. And Craig preached on this last week, but Basically, we need to understand that, that love is not just simply this idea of passion. Love is not just merely eros, type of, uh, the type of love. Love is something that is also marked by submission and obedience. And so Jesus says, if you love me, then you will obey my commands. So obedience is directly tied to love. And so as we continue this morning, we're taking a look at another pretty famous passage. And it's actually a passage that I preached on a couple of years ago here at Union Church as a part of our I Am series, when we talked about the seven I Am statements. And Jesus goes on to say, I am the vine and you are the branches. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning at Union Church. Would you pray with me as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord this morning? Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Father that even this morning we have electricity here at Union Church. We didn't on Friday afternoon. We thank you that we're able to have air and lights and sound this morning. We thank you, Father God, for a safe holiday for us. We thank you, Father God, for our visitors who are here this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and faithfulness. In your name we pray, amen. Well, my wife and I, we had a nice carnival holiday and uh, don't worry, I wasn't like out in the streets in Copacabana, okay, you don't need to worry. And I, w I wouldn't do that anyways, I have no interest. You know, I'm not judging people, but zero interest in going and being among millions of people and putting myself at risk of, you know, whatever. So I wasn't there, so we, we sumiu, let's say, we left, and we went to, we went to Nova Freiburger, at Freiburg, and actually went to Lumiar, uh, and we went to a situ of, of our friend George, who's a part of the Union Church leadership, and we spent a couple days there. And then later we went up to Minas Gerais, and we went to Juizhi Foda. And I'm sharing this with a purpose. There's a reason I'm sharing this. So it was a great, for me it was really different. It was kind of like a fazenda situ kind of uh, break, which for me is not normally. I'm normally a beach person. So it was really fun just kind of doing something different. And I love Minas Gerais. I love the people. I love the food. It was, it was fantastic. Uh, and so, anyways, as we were going from George's house, George's situ, to Minas Gerais, it's basically all mountains. And so you're going through, and you're going through kind of near Petropolis, and you're going through Terrazopolis and Nova Freiburg, and, and, and you're going up to Jujifoda, and there's just no other way. And so as we're going there, we get on one of these unpaved, unpaved gravel roads, which is basically what George lives off of, and it takes at least a half an hour, at least, minimum. Even up, to, even up to 45 minutes just on one road. But we, as we were going to George's, Way showed us this sort of direction, and I just assumed, you know, which is sort of American failure, okay, here in Brazil, okay, <laughs> failure, American, I mean, let's trust, no. So I get in this city called Corretenses, and I get up there, and we, we, we arrive there, and we were already on this gravel road for quite some time, and we realized that this gravel road wasn't just gonna go up straight like we thought it was. And we arrived at the convenience store and the guy says, listen, I don't, know what this, I don't know what this route is that you're talking about, but that's just basically a hiking trail. You're not gonna get up there. As a matter of fact, you're gonna have to go all the way down and go all the way back around. And, in, and as I calculated it, we had another hour and 50 minutes because of this mistake, just about two hours. 
And so, to make things worse, as we had to go back on that gravel road, my tire blew it out of our car, so we had a flat tire. So I'm there in the middle of nowhere. I hadn't seen a car in at least 10 minutes. At least 10 minutes, I, I saw no car. And it was a piece of iron, like a piece of ferro, that, that you know, kind of just broke the tire. Uh, uh, and, and so I was there on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere with my wife and my two daughters. I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do now? So, I mean, I know how to change a tire. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna start to change this tire, except for I couldn't get the iron out of the, out of the tire because it was so profoundly, it was so deep in the tire, and I couldn't do it with my bare hands. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I need a, I need a tool. I need a ferramento to do this. I didn't have the tool, so I'm like, I guess I'm just going to have to wait till somebody arrives here. And literally within two minutes, a guy arrives with his family, and he just jumps out of the car. He's so excited. He's like, I've never seen anybody like this. And he's like, can I help you? And I'm like, yes. And he said, it looks like you have a flat tire. And I'm like, yes, I have a flat tire. And, and he goes on and he says, you know what? He, it, this car is like kind of, you know, old and beaten down car. And, and he opens up his trunk. He's got this big toolbox with all these tools. And he has like a, 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 a you know, exactly what I needed, which is kind of like a pliers and almost some kind of wrench thing to take it out. And he just goes there and you know, boom, he starts doing it. And then he's like, I'm just going to change your tire for you. And I'm like, no, I can do it. You know, all manly. I can do it. He's like, no, just let me do it. I'm like, okay, whatever. So he starts to change the tire for me. I'm like, okay. I'm thinking I'll give the guy a little bit of money. You know, we're, we're fine here. And, um, and, 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 after a while, I just asked him, I said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I knew he was a Christian. I knew from the moment he got out of the car, he was a Christian. And so as a matter of fact, you're not only a Christian, you're e either you're an obrero, né? obrero, or you're some kind of worker, and I know you're probably assembly of God. And he says, you know what, you're right. As a matter of fact, I'm assembly of God pastor. I'm like, I knew I, you know, acertou, I got it right, yeah? Sorry, a lot of Portuguese this morning, I'll stop with that. So anyways, uh, it was cool because he, he, he really blessed me, but I knew from the minute that the guy, guy got out of the car that he was a Christian. There was something about his demeanor. He was a Christian. I knew it for sure. And, you know, his daughter started to play with uh, Olivia and Sophia. And, and you know what he said to me? He said, Jay, you know what? There's not enough good in the world. We need to take care of one another. And, and, I, and I said, you're right. And, and he said, what, what many Brazilians say to me, he's like, what are you doing here in Brazil? <laughs> and I said, well, I work in Rio and I'm a pastor. And he's like, ah, you're a pastor. I figured you were a pastor. Would you come to my church in Cabo for you and preach? And then he asked me if I charged to preach, which I thought was a strange question. And, and, and so I said, no, maybe one day I'll get over there. You know, I have some friends over there and I'd love to get over there. And he finished with the tire, and then, and then he said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you follow me, and we'll go another 15 kilometers, because we have to go in this direction anyway, so we'll go to my situ. And he said, and if you can't find where you're going, because obviously you're lost, then basically you can stay with me and my family for the carnival holiday. And I was like, wow, this guy's really out of this world. So we get to the situ, and he said, it's kind of humble. That's what he said about, you know, it's a simple place. And sure it was. I looked at the situ and it, it looked like a, basically a one, a one bedroom house. Um, and, but it was exactly what he wanted and he needed. And it was a house that he owned. And it was a, it was a refuge for him during the carnival holiday. And, and I, I just left that deeply, deeply moved. And not only that, but at the end he started like prophesying over me and all this stuff. But that's another story that one day I'll share. But... I would always deeply move because of his love for me and because of the fact that it was like God just sent an angel, like literally at just the right time. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, well, Jay, you know, people are friendly in Brazil and that could have happened any time, but I'm telling you, there was no one on this road. It was right away. The guy was more than willing to help. I mean, what kind of guy just says, just come and stay with us for carnival? I mean, it was amazing. And so we were shocked. It was as if an angel had met us on the journey. God's providence was very evident at that moment. Who would have ever thought that at that very moment, God would have sent the right person to help us? But I knew that this guy was in the vine. I knew that this guy had a relationship with Jesus. I didn't have any doubt about that. What would our world look like if all of us that were Christians actually had that kind of behavior? As I reflected on my life, I, I thought, how often do I have that kind of disposition? Do people instantly know that I'm a Christian? 
And so that question is not just for me, but it's for you as well. Do people know that you are a Christian? Like, do they really know? Now, before you give me the answer that you think I want to hear, yes, Pastor Jay, people know I'm a Christian because of whatever, X, Y, and Z. Be sure that you can honestly answer that question. I once heard a story of a, of a woman who had been working at her, in an administrative job for about 28 years. And she had a retirement party. And at the retirement party, she invited um, uh, her pastor, among many other people. And she, at the party, she says, I feel so bad because I'm not sure anybody around me, anybody at work, knows that I'm a Christian. And the pastor asked her why, and she said, well, I've been quietly waiting here for 28 years for someone to come and ask me about Jesus, and no one ever has. And that's crazy. I mean, even if she behaved as a Christian, why would she go for 28 years and not share Jesus with at least one coworker? I mean, did she think that if people are evangelized kind of like by osmosis? While it's true that our actions are more, oftentimes more important than words, words are still necessary for people to, to understand and believe in the gospel story. And so, as we get into our text this morning, I want us to understand that there are two kinds of people in terms of the Christian world. Those who clearly abide in the vine, and it's clear for everybody, and those whom it's not so clear that they abide in the vine. And when, when, with the people who, with whom it's not so clear that they abide in the vine, it's a problem for us in the church. It's a problem for all of us on two levels. First, because those who do not clearly abide in the vine end up giving a bad testimony to the church, or at least a mixed testimony, because their behavior is not aligned with their beliefs. Second, those who do not clearly abide in the vine make us question whether or not they're truly Christians. And so a tree is judged by its fruit. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, are those, are, are, are those we doubt about in this world of those who do not abide in the vine truly His? Do they truly belong to Jesus? As I've mentioned a couple times here at Union Church, one of the favorite passages of every non-Christian, and certainly every postmodern, secular, progressive, humanist, rationalist person, is this. They love the scripture, judge not, lest ye, lest ye be judged. They love that. Especially when it comes to matters of faith or behavior. But the problem is they're taking that scripture a little bit out of context. Because when Jesus is talking about that, he's just basically saying we need to have a proper self-knowledge, a proper understanding of our own sin before we consider judging others. We need to take the speck, or excuse me, the plank out of our own eye before we take the speck out of someone else's eye, right? And so the idea of not judging just be, is like this. Be humble enough to realize that you're a loser too sometimes, that you're a sinner. And once you recognize that you, once you have that humility, then you probably have a better perspective to judge appropriately because the Bible says that we will judge a tree by its fruit. And the idea that we don't make judgments is ridiculous, as I mentioned once before here. We make judgments all the time. We make all kinds of moral judgments, all kinds of discriminatory judgments even. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes, you know, they're right. I'm just saying we make judgments all the time. So the idea of, of a world where no judgment ever happens, it, 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 you know, it, it, does, it just doesn't exist. It doesn't make any sense. So a tree is judged by its fruit. That means that we should at least consider the possibility that it's our responsibility as a church to test and to see, though, to test and see those who have a faith that seems a little, that doesn't seem very genuine, whether or not they're really Christians. Because it's our responsibility to help guide them along and say, hey, listen, perhaps you're part of this part, perhaps you're part of, the, of, of being a branch that could be thrown into the fire and burned, as Jesus talks about. Because Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to come into heaven, is going to be a part of eternity. So it's something we don't want to play with. We don't play with people's salvation. So I'd rather at times be at risk 
of challenging someone on their salvation to test the genuineness of it instead of just letting that person go and do whatever they want. I think it's more loving, although oftentimes people don't like it at the time, right? So let's open our Bibles to John 15, verse 1. Let's stand as we read this passage together this morning. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will even be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself and must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and while words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you would bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Amen. You may be seated. So as I mentioned, this is just one more conversation that actually follows pretty well with what Craig talked about last week about if you love me, obey my commands. Because Jesus is talking about the importance of obedience, right? And this is kind of tied into that. It's kind of like, if you're really my disciples, you're going to obey my teaching. And if you obey my teaching, then you're going to bear fruit. And if you bear fruit, then you're, everyone's going to know that you're in the vine. Now, let me give you a little context here. Most people, most commentaries believe that the upper room was along the pathway of the Mount of Olives going to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, why is this important? Because there are vineyards that were probably all around. And as we know, a vineyard is a type of garden. And it's actually more difficult type of garden to have than even a normal garden. And I can imagine that the, the, the disciples and Jesus are walking, have walked along at some point, saw these vineyards, saw the olive groves, and Jesus makes this kind of proclamation in that context that he's a true vine. Now, in these times, the Jews were also very familiar with cultivating vineyards, with making wine. Water was something precious uh, in the ancient Near East, and so wine was even more of a necessity than even a luxury. It was something very common. It was a part of life. Wine also, scripturally, has always meant something. Throughout scriptures, the prophets use the idea of overflowing wine to kind of describe God's blessing upon a people. And when wine was scarce, it was evidence of God's sort of discipline upon his people or even judgment. And so these prophets compared God's people to a vineyard, saying that when wine was scarce, it was evidence of their disobedience and of their unfaithfulness. We see this in Isaiah 57, Ezekiel 15, where the prophet declares that Jerusalem is a useless vine, only to be used for firewood. So, the point is this, God is going to judge his people who do not live righteously. Now, the concept of the vine throughout Scripture also, this is really important, if you miss this part, and most preachers don't get this, I'll be honest, the vine refers to the nation of Israel, and then later to Jesus himself. So, just as Jesus is the true bread, okay, that we read about in John 6, 32. Jesus is also the true vine, which means that he is the original source of all provision. Because when we talk about bread and we talk about the vine or wine, we're talking about what? Two very important elements that, as a matter of fact, have to do with the, the sacrament of, of, of uh, Holy Communion. So, Jesus is making the bold claim in verse 1 that he is the vine. Now, most preachers will preach this and they'll say, you just need to stay in the vine and be moral and do good things like Jesus did because it's the result of following Jesus. Now, there's some truth to that, but what Jesus is really saying in this passage above everything else is that I am the true Israel. You understand? I am the true servant of God, and I am the only one that's going to be able to satisfy God's wrath upon his people because of their sin. And so Jesus is not only making a statement about how we should live, he's also saying that he's the only perfect answer. He's the only one that can answer on our behalf. And so when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's saying, you're not going to be able to be a vine by yourself. He's saying, I am doing what you cannot do, and I am being what you have not been able to do. 
Ela está dizendo que eu vou fazer o que você não pode fazer. Eu sou capaz para fazer o que você nunca vai ser capaz para fazer. Ou fazer. And so this realization is important for people like us who have never really been able to take care of our own vineyards because it's hard. I mean, I'm a terrible gardener. But even if you're a good gardener, you need Jesus because he represents the true vine. So Jesus is saying, one more time, I am who you can never be and you will never be, be able to be and that's okay because I'm God. I'm the true vine. And so this is comforting for the disciples. This is comforting for us. And so in the busyness of our own lives, Jesus responds. And some of you, maybe this morning, you're stressed out because you're like, life's tough and I'm heading into a new season and I'm just kind of anxious about it. Or, you know, I don't have a job right now or I don't know if I'm going to be in Brazil later this year. And you're having a tough time and Jesus is saying, I've got this. Stop stressing, stop striving, stop being anxious, stop all of it and trust that I have your life under control because I am doing what you cannot do and I am being who, will, who you will never be able to be because I'm the true vine. And that brings us great freedom. That brings us great freedom. Being in the vine and abiding in the vine is not just about remembering that Jesus is a source, but it's also about the fact that we can rest fully in Jesus. And so some of us maybe need to rest a little bit today, despite all the holidays that we've had. We've been running hard and Jesus is saying, relax, I've got this, remain in me. I know that you have not been able to be as fruitful as you wanted to be. You're not going to be fruitful enough to please God on your own efforts. But you've got me. I am the vine. I am Israel. I'm representing Israel. I, I, I rescue this imagery of judgment and failure, and I redeem it. I redeem it. And if we go back to the text in Ezekiel 15, we see that the branch of a vine is only good for two things, either for fruit or for fuel, either to bear something or to be burned. Now, nobody can manufacture fruit, right? You can't manufacture fruit. You might be able to do some creative things with, you know, some of the new hormones or whatever. Not, that's not the right word, but <laughs> I'm not a scientist, okay? My dad was a science teacher and he is perpetually disappointed with my, with my science capacity, among other things. <laughs> No one can manufacture fruit, right? But what is one element of fruit? Fruit always has seeds, always has seeds. It always has the seeds in it for more fruit. And so as branches in the vine, we, we, we draw upon Christ's life and we bear fruit for his glory. If we're not bearing fruit for his glory, we're not fulfilling, fulfilling our purpose on earth and we're not really living. And so when we don't bear fruit, people don't even know that we're Christians which goes back to that story I was sharing. People are confused. When we don't bear fruit, we run the risk of wasting our lives instead of investing our lives in eternal things. Look at verse five. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, that's a message in and of itself that I'm not even gonna get to today. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So what does it mean to us to bear much fruit? Let me put this in simple terms. First, we should be sharing Jesus. We should be leading people to Jesus as a natural reflection of our lives. We should be growing in personal holiness. We should be demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, excuse me, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so I want Union Church to be a place where we bear much fruit for the glory of God. And so our job is to be faithful and to let the Father cause us to bear fruit. Because at the end of the day, it's the Father that's the gardener. It's not us. And some of us are going to bear a lot of fruit, and others of us are going to bear less fruit, and it's okay. God gives us all different talents and treasures and ways, but we all should be bearing fruit. Now, the true bearing of fruit is oftentimes time-consuming. 
right? It requires a lot of factors, some of which that are in our control and some of which are out of our control. For example, bearing fruit in a garden requires good soil, it requires sun, it requires rain, it re requires usually a gardener who knows what he's doing. And the more we're rooted in Jesus and his love, the more the soil will be perfect for producing fruit. Sometimes it takes time to produce fruit. I remember several years ago when I dreamt of planting the, the evening church at Gadisha Hidden Tor. And I knew it was a dream and I knew people th thought, quite frankly, that was crazy. How in the world is this American ever going to be able to preach in Portuguese and ever going to be able to grow anything in a different language, in a different culture? And it was so hard because at the beginning, I had to spend hours preparing for each message, not only preparing the text, but rehearsing. And I still rehearse to this day quite a bit. It took a long time to see fruit, but by God's grace, we've seen a lot of fruit in the, in, in the recent season. And I think one of the reasons why is because I persevered in the vine. I persevered in what the Lord had called me to do. And some, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm the best example of this, but I do think we all need to grow in perseverance. Sometimes when I talk to pastors who are disappointed with things that are going on in their churches or they haven't seen growth or things aren't going very well, I say to them, listen, the best advice I have for you is to simply persevere. And never make a moment at your low point, or excuse me, never make a, a decision to quit at your low point. Always persevere. Perseverance is something that's in short supply these days. People don't want to persevere, especially in the younger generations. So we need to grow in perseverance. When we persevere, we start to see more and more and more and more fruits. It's cumulative, it's exponential even at some point. So, now, there's some things, again, that are in our control, some things that are out of our control. Perfection is not the goal. Don't forget that apart from Jesus, we can't do anything, right? And so, we, we can only do our best in this broken and fallen world to produce fruit for the goodness and, and for the glory of God. We're going to fall short over and over again, but we have Jesus, who is our hope, now, the challenge for some of us is, is that, that there are some who are simply not going to abide, right? Some people are not going to abide in the vine. They're going to give the appearance of being Christians, but they're not going to persevere. Judas Iscariot was one of these. He was, called by, he was called by Jesus. He lived with him. He ministered from place to place with Jesus. He masqueraded as a converted man, but was not attached by faith to the vine. And consequently, he was cut off and thrown away. As the Bible says in 1 John, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would remain with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. It's a scary passage. Judas gave every impression that he was a true believer in Jesus. He looked good. He took care of the finances of the disciples. He took care of many practical needs, yet the curse was upon him. We read in Matthew 26, it would have been better for him if he would not have been born. Some of us feel so far from being someone like Jesus, we don't think we could ever be, Judas, excuse me, we don't think we could ever be like Judas, but Judas stands before us as a warning. While I don't believe it's possible for us to be genuinely converted and actually lose our salvation, I do think it's possible for someone to be apparently converted while actually being lost. Because a few outward indications of conversion are not necessarily sufficient. Like you can go to church, you can be a nice person, you can have sort of the Christian jargon, the Christian vernacular, and not really be a Christian. If we are not spiritually united to Jesus, then our connection to his church doesn't really mean all that much. And so not everyone who professes faith may truly be born again. Now, understand when I say profess. Again, Jesus says in Matthew 13 that we'll recognize people by their fruits. What you are on the inside will eventually be recognizable on the outside. And so some people may profess, but it's not a profession that's sincere. It's sort of some kind of confession that's not real sincere. And what they are on the outside eventually will be recognized on, what they are on the inside, excuse me, will eventually be recognized on the outside. Christians will always bear 
the moral and spiritual fruit that is evidence of their faith over the long haul. Over the long haul. And if they don't, it's perfectly okay for us to ask ourselves the question, are they really Christians? It's okay to ask that question. Our obedience, our works, our fruit is not the result, or excuse me, our obedience, our works, and our fruit is not the root or the cause of our salvation. You understand? I want to be very clear about that. But it is the evidence or the consequence of our salvation. And so in the absence of any kind of fruit like this, we should question others and we should question ourselves because eternity is at stake. And so we must never assume that someone's a Christian just because they engage in church. Jesus said that there would be people who will say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name? And what did he, what did he say? Jesus didn't say, ah, no, you didn't do that. He didn't say, no, that's not true. He said this, I never knew, I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We must be certain that we are in the vine bearing fruit for the Father's glory. So Jesus is saying in this passage that there may even be some superficial branches, those who have verbally identified with him, but only in an external way. We, Jesus knows that the, the, the tendency to, to delude ourselves, to, to delusion, is remarkable for the human being. He knows that some would say they believe in them, in Jesus, but not with any concern about their own sin. And he says in John 8, 34, you are still slaves to sin. He even uses some harsh language. He even calls them children of the devil. And so we don't want to be fruitless branches. And more importantly, we don't want to be people who are not genuinely converted. We don't want to be people who are super, superficially connected to God. Because if so, we're, event, we're not going to be in the vine. And I'm not here to question the salvation of anyone this morning, but I do have an important question for each one of us. Do, do you know that you're in the vine? And do other people recognize that you're in the vine? Do you know Jesus, or are you going through some of the motions of Christianity? And if you find yourself confused about it, I'm not trying to, to make you question your salvation, but I do think it's healthy for us to examine ourselves. Even the Bible says this examine and test our faith and say, you know what, I do believe in Jesus. I am walking with Jesus. I have a desire to walk with Jesus. I have a concern for other people who don't know Jesus. I, I, I feel convicted by sin. My heart isn't so hard that I, that I don't feel any conviction for sin anymore. When God is the gardener of our lives, when he's the tender, when he's, when he's taking care of the vines, He's always going to make the story of our lives into something beautiful because we're entirely in union with Him. And so this morning, I want to encourage us to examine ourselves, that we would examine ourselves and we would say, am I really in the vine? Am I really walking with Jesus? Because at the end of the day, I, I, anyone can bear some kind of fruit. But if you're genuinely converted, you genuinely know Jesus, you're going to produce something different over the long run. You're going to glorify Jesus. Your, your life is not going to look constantly like a bunch of weeds and thorns for years and years and years and years and years. And people are like, that person says they're a Christian, but everyone's kind of like, you need to be a part of a well-watered garden, which is a church, a church community. You can't do it on your own. You know, both Jeremiah and Isaiah describe God's people as a well-watered garden. And, and he talks about their holy lives. And, he talks, and they talk about lives that are not afraid to go against the stream. It talks about lives that are not caught up with the trivialities of our day. Lives that are worth living for. We have something that we, work, that we want to die for, that we want to live for. A life that's found something, that, that's found something worth living and dying for. We're only going to find that life if we're in the vine. We're only going to find that life if we're in Jesus. Are we truly living in the vine or are we a little bit of a fraud? Perhaps God is calling you this morning. He's calling you out and he's saying, you know what? This message is a warning for you because I love you. This is a warning. Are you truly abiding in me? Have you truly given your heart to me? Or are you still worshiping so many different idols that 
you're not really even in the vine. Perhaps you feel like you've been pruned these days, pruned. That doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. That's a part of sanctification, right? That's probably where most of us are. We're being pruned. I've gone through that. It's a tough season, but it's a gift from the Lord. But it's better to be pruned than to be cut off. God's calling us to surrender ourselves to him, to surrender our lives to him. And don't forget, once we do that once, we don't need to question our salvation for always. Like, we have a genuine conversion experience. We're walking with Jesus. Once we have that true, genuine conversion, we can remember what Jesus basically saying here. I've got this. I am the vine. You are the branches. I went to the cross for you. There's no need for you to stress I've got it. I, I'm doing what you are unable to do because I am who, who you will never be able to be. So you just need to worship me. You just need to follow me. And you just need to rest in me. You just need to give your anxieties to me and abide in me. And if we do that, I believe that we will bear much fruit. Amen? Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray this morning, if there's anyone here among us that is not truly abiding in you, that has a superficial sort of faith, that you would reveal it to them, that they would do a self-examination this morning. And for those of us who are going through pruning this morning, Lord, that you would show us that that's okay, that we can rest in you, that you are sovereign, that you have plans that are different and better than our plans. And for those of us, Lord, who don't feel like we're bearing a lot of fruit, allow us to recognize that things take time, that we need to persevere. And so no matter where we're, we're all at this morning, Lord God, I pray that you administer to us by your mercy and by your grace this morning. In your name we pray, amen and amen. This morning, if you really were touched by this message and you're like, Pastor G, I don't really know where I'm at with all of this, I'd love to pray with you at the end of the service. And, or you can fill out one of the cards and say, hey, I wanna be contacted, I wanna be prayed for, or I made some decision today, and turn it in at the connection table at the end of the service, okay? This is, we're talking about spiritual matters that are, that are very important. Let's stand as we continue to worship this morning.